Hello, everyone. Actually, it's a, it's a mistake. I put 2014 because <laughs> Jennifer and I we were here two years ago, but this is for the 2015 uh, Breakthrough Prize in Life uh, Sciences. So it's my, my great pleasure and a great honor for me to be a, a speaker in this symposium and celebrate science with you. So I would like to give you my views um, of where the CRISPR-Cas field will stand in 10 years from now. But I'm aware of the fact that some of you may not know what uh, CRISPR-Cas is. So for those who are not um, biologists, so sorry, this is... Uh, oh, yes. What is CRISPR-Cas9? Uh, so it's um, actually, initially, uh, originally an immune system that exists in, in bacteria and uh, that has been harnessed into a powerful uh, technology allowing to edit genomes, genes, and their expression in uh, cells and organisms in a really unprecedented uh, manner. So it has made the highlight of a large number of articles in the public media for its recognized potential in the life science field. And most of you may have already read at least one article in the, in the newspapers. And I would like to discuss my views of the future of CRISPR-Cas at large, so the biology of the system, the development of the technology, the exploitation of the technology, and if I have time, some glimpse into societal implications. So, so CRISPR-Cas9 is... Um, is, as I said, an adaptive immune system which uh, macroorganisms like bacteria and archaea have evolved to defend themselves against genetic elements that are mobile, uh, maybe meaning genetic elements that can spread from cells to cells. And they can be, by nature, plasmids, viruses of bacteria, called also bacteriophages or transposons. And those mobile genetic elements can bring new genes to the cells the functions of which can be detrimental or beneficial for the infected macroorganism. So macroorganisms, like any organism in the planet, have, have immune systems, and there are different types of defense systems existing. CRISPR-Cas is one of them, and it's particular because it has an adaptive feature in the sense that it first uh, uh, allows uh, recognition of the foreign genetic element, and then the system is using two components, uh, which you can see here, so an RNA component uh, that contains a memorized mark of the recognized genetic element, and then a protein component that can be guided by the RNA molecule to recognize sequence specifically uh, the genome of the mobile genetic element, cleave the genome of the foreign genetic element, and ultimately interfere with the maintenance of this uh, genetic element. So, CRISPR-Cas9 originates from uh, focusing the research on one of the CRISPR-Cas subtypes that exist in bacteria. So it's a, it's a system that has largely evolved in different types of mechanisms. And the CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism is really unique in its uh, simplicity and sophistication. And this is this unique mechanism that has allowed to harness it into really this transformative gene editing technology. So with regard really to uh, the way CRISPR-Cas9 works, it's really a, a protein here in blue that is uh, guided by an RNA molecule that can be programmed uh, to recognize any uh, sequence of DNA of interest and introduce uh, double-stranded DNA breaks in, in the DNA. And the technology means that uh, if one uses this technology to target site specifically any sequence on the genome, when after uh, the introducing the, the breaks on the DNA, as Steve Alec, uh, explained to us at the beginning of the afternoon, uh, you can trigger different types of, of repair machineries in the cells that can ultimately result in various modifications on the DNA, depending on how the biologist will design the tool. So with regard to the, to the biology of the system, uh, I just want to say uh, some words of where were we 10 years ago. Actually, 10 years ago, we didn't know much about the system. Uh, mainly from the work published by bioinformaticians, mostly. We knew the composition of the CRISPR-Cas locus. We knew also with the work of some biologists that there were some RNA molecules expressed and processed. Uh, and there was this prediction that uh, the system would work as an adaptive immune system in bacteria and archaea, and it would be an RNA-guided system. But that was it. 
And uh, after 10 years of research, actually, that has really witnessed uh, a very impressive number of publications by my colleagues, mostly macrobiologists, we could describe in detail the system, the evolution of the system in bacteria and archaea, and uh, my colleagues really have demonstrated a variety of unique mechanisms of defense. Uh, what was also shown is that the system can have other biological functions than adaptive immunity. So 10 years is a, is a long time, but can be also short time in biological research. But uh, I'm sure that everyone, including my, my uh, talented colleagues of the CRISPR-Cas biology uh, research field, will agree to say that this field has been developing unusually fast. So in my laboratory, for example, 10 years ago, in 2006, we had just identified uh, the two RNA molecules that are composing the CRISPR-Cas9 system, and only seven years ago, we were really starting to, to understand how the different components would assemble together to really uh, explain the biology of the system, and then everything uh, else went extremely fast, and the field has been really uh, exploding and exponentially uh, growing in an in really an impressive, impressive fashion. So what can we expect in the next 10 years with regard to the biology of CRISPR-Cas? You can definitely predict that we will have accumulated even more knowledge regarding the biological and mechanistic details of the various types of CRISPR-Cas immune defense systems, hoping to find even more subtypes of CRISPR-Cas systems that could also be exploited for further technologies. So this will certainly happen only uh, with the increasing knowledge of sequences of complete genomes of more microorganisms that can be cultivated or not, what we call uh, sequencing of metagenomes, whether we talk about clinical isolates or isolates from the environment. So this is really by studying the diversity and the evolution of the microbial world that we can be given the chance to identify new types of defense systems or so, other than CRISPR-Cas, that could potentially be exploited in, for genome uh, editing technologies or for uh, gene silencing technologies. And one should not forget that the tools that are used uh, in molecular biology and genetics by the biologists and that have been used over the last 50 years mostly originate from basic research on microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, and, and really studying different systems of these microorganisms. So the same applies for delivery tools, uh, nanoparticles or so uh, viral-based delivery tools. Uh, all those tools are so um, developed thanks to the knowledge of, of what uh, is uh, happening in terms of biology of viruses and also um, biology of bacterial vesicles, for example. And only with the recognition that uh, the field of fundamental microbiology needs support, funding, and, and also young sciences, we will have the chance to discover exciting DNA and RNA targeting mechanisms with uh, applicability potential. So if I switch to the development of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, it's a technology that is very versatile, uh, easy to use, cheap to use for the biologist, and it's very versatile thanks to the unique feature of this um, RNA-guided uh, system with an enzyme, a nuclease, that uh, uses two nuclease domains to cleave the, the DNA. And this specific mechanism has really led to, to the possibility to, to use the technology to perform different, uh, different tricks on, on the DNA, whether it's to uh, delete uh, genomes, uh, delete uh, specific, sorry, specific uh, genes, uh, specific sequences on, on genomes, whether it, to, it is to introduce some uh, mutations, correct some mutations, or also modulate uh, the expression of, of gene uh, at the DNA and uh, RNA level, also the ability to, to mark uh, the, the DNA in a sequence-specific manner, to study the epigenetic marks, to label the DNA. So really a large diversity, and over the last four years, we have really witnessed an incredible joint forces of the scientific community to develop also the technology to be more specific, to really target specifically the sequence of DNA that has to be targeted, and also the technology that has been adapted to work in a large variety of cells and organisms. So uh, having in mind that the technology works in all cells and organisms that have been studied so far, as long as you have the right delivery tool to bring CRISPR-Cas9 to the nucleus of the cells, uh, and, and uh, as long as, as you have surely the possibility to study organisms and, and, and cells with regard to ethical purposes. 
So what can we predict in 10 years from now? We can certainly predict that there will be even more uh, possible ranges of modifications or labeling of DNA and possibilities to modulate gene expression. We will have certainly developed uh, an increasing variety of tools, but adapted specifically for the variety of cells and organisms and genes and DNA sequences to modify, having in mind that the repair machineries of the cells are essential for the technology to work, and they are different from cells to cells, and we are far from understanding also their efficiency depending on the cells or organisms uh, that are studied. We can predict that there will be a large number of protocols available that will allow to the biologists to really apply the right recipe depending on the purpose of usage, uh, whether we speak about how to engineer the protein and the RNA, how to deliver the, the RNA and the protein depending on the, on the genes to, to modify and depending on the cells that are studied. Uh, we also can predict that efforts in studying in detail the, the diverse uh, biology, um, the, the diverse system, CRISPR-Cas9 system that are existing in, in, in various bacterial species where the system originates from, together with the efforts in protein and RNA engineering, will, will have resulted in a more uh, specific and efficient technology. And uh, I'm, I'm really certain that uh, in 10 years from now, certain cells and organisms that are a bit difficult to tackle uh, will be easier to, to, to study with regard to CRISPR-Cas9. Cas9. Also, as I said, with uh, the increasing uh, development of the viral delivery technologies, the nanoparticle technologies, electroporation technologies to bring the technology to the right cell. And also, whether we speak about delivering the DNA encoding the system, the RNA of the system, or, or the purified RNA-guided protein. Uh, now, with regard to the applications, are diverse uh, applications, and the most important uh, impact for me that is immediately visible is really the implication of the technology in basic research and in research and development. So I, I just want to, to talk about an, an example, uh, uh, personal, uh, personal example, which is that, uh, that I really started my career uh, in the field of antibiotic resistance, uh, trying to understand the biochemistry and genetics of the highly clinically relevant phenomenon, actually, that has been very useful for me to understand the CRISPR-Cas9 system. But my interest broadened very early on in my career in the field of infectious diseases with the aim to understand how bacteria cause diseases in, in humans. And, and like a lot of in infection biologists, we are always limited in the, in the tools and in the, the genetics that we can use in the right organisms. I mean, we're always frustrated because ultimately we want to work with, uh, with the right types of cells and human cells or humanized animal models. And this was really limited uh, prior to, to, to CRISPR-Cas9 and also prior to talent and, and zinfinger nucleases. So what is very exciting in the field is that this uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology, also with regard to other types of, of technologies that allow to, to really grow, cult cultivate primary cells from patients, stem cells, other types of cells. We can really increase uh, the, the knowledge and, and, and work with uh, the right specimen that are more clinically relevant and more biologically relevant. So I think it's, it's really an exciting time for young biologists because, because CRISPR-Cas9, together with the technologies like all these more precise imaging technologies, technologies, as I said, to cultivate cells or organoids, to differentiate cells, to sequence the genomes more deeply, everything together really will increase certainly the knowledge in life sciences dramatically and in the next 10 years, I'm sure. And that there will be new types of knowledge and dogma that will be delivered to the, by the community to, to the public. And we'll certainly see the technology continue to develop, to increase the variety of methods that allow to screen for new targets for therapeutics for the medical point of view, to develop models that facilitate the validation of medicine and development. Uh, we will have seen an increasing number, at least, of clinical trials using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology in an ex vivo approach when you combine the technology, the gene therapy technology with the cell therapy technology, I think primarily to treat blood disorders and hopefully beyond. We will see certainly in the, in the aspect to, um, uh, to really apply the technology using uh, really an in vivo approach, we will see at least efforts to improve safer and more efficient delivery technology with, as I said, uh, uh, the technology that uh, uh, hopefully will make it even more, more specific. 
Um, and then also various strategies that will be further developed to explore the technology beyond the human gene therapy field, as it was also mentioned today in the immunocancer therapy field, so with uh, the engineering of CAR T cells, also other approaches to treat cancers or the treatment of infectious diseases. Another field that is very exciting is surely the plant biology field with the possibility now to edit the genomes of plants in a very precise fashion without any foreign DNA that is left uh, after manipulation of the genome. So also with a questioning of what is meant by a genetically modified organism. And also in the synthetic um, biology field that is also very helpful in terms of biotechnology purposes for food production, or production of other, other um, chemical components. So it's, it's a, a very uh, exciting uh, application that we will see developed in the, in the next uh, 10 years. And I would like to, to finish uh, briefly with also what I hope or expect or wish to see in the next 10 years with regard to the societal implications of this technology. So I hope that in the next 10 years, at least, to see the result of increasing efforts from the scientific community, but also the media, to properly educate the public with what is CRISPR-Cas9. What do we mean with this precise genome editing technology? So that the public can really appreciate the positive aspects of the technology and have the chance to participate in the ethical debate and be positive about the technology. And also, I wish to see more young scientists choosing the field of life sciences and appreciate that they are living in, a, in an exciting time when finally a large number of biological questions that could not be answered five, ten years ago from now can now be, be answered thanks to CRISPR-Cas9 and all the, the various technologies which are mentioned around CRISPR-Cas9 that are really transformative, uh, tr that are really transformative for, the, for the field of, of life sciences. With regard to ethical considerations, it's also uh, an exciting time for ethicists working in the field of genome editing and engineering. So there have been, uh, over the last two years, increasing discussions involving members of national academies and international academies, ethicists, experts in regulations around working with genomes in cells and organisms, and also with scientists and developers. And I'm sure that there will be increasing discussions. It will be amplified, hopefully resulting in, in more targeted regulations that allow to increase the scope of genome uh, engineering in labs, so that allow researchers to be innovative, yet uh, really uh, making sure that uh, there are also some restrictive rules with regard to applications of the technology we would not like to see uh, emerging. And to conclude, I'm, I'm sure that the next 10 years will be very, very exciting, and that all these technologies, including the CRISPR-Cas9 technologies, will lead to further transformative innovations in in the field of life sciences, and that it will be uh, very exciting data that we will see produced by biologists. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay.